So I'm just going to whiz through the kind of uh, genesis of the programme first off. So some of you may have heard of, of Back from the Brink, uh, or even our Scottish sister project, Species on the Edge. So essentially, um, we're part of a family of species recovery programmes across the UK. And the Rethink Nature Consortium very much kick-started this process back uh, following the publication of the State of Nature in 2013. Um, some of the, the, the principal species focus NGOs got together uh, uh, and decided we wanted to work um, across silos um, and, and more, more collaboratively. Um, and rather than being single taxa focused or specifically focused on particular groups, try and take, take a, a whole species approach. So that's what led to Back from the Brink. So that was by partnering with the statutory agency in England, with Natural England, and they secured lottery funding. It was then called Heritage Lottery Funding, it's now called Heritage Fund, it's National Lottery Heritage Fund, but it's essentially uh, the same same monies. Um, so that is concluding this month. So that's been a very successful programme um, and we've learned an awful lot from that. And it was so successful that there was a desire for the partners to replicate a similar model um, in other parts of the UK. That's what led to Species on the Edge. So that same group of seven partners on the top left came together uh, with Nature Scots. That's a new name for SNH. Um, and they are just now coming to the end of their development phase uh, with heritage funding from the National Lottery. Natir and Beth um, had been in development for, for, for quite a few years, sort of really started about sort of 2018, 2019. Um, our partnership is slightly larger than those in England and Scotland because we also have Marine Conservation Society and we also have Vincent Wildlife Trust within the core partnership, plus obviously uh, uh, NRW as the statutory partner. But it is a consortium of partners. Um, NRW is the statutory lead in the sense that we actually receive the money from the National Lottery and Welsh Government, and then that is that is distributed across the partnership. But um, but it, everybody's doing lots of heavy lifting across the, the partnership. It's very much a, a collective endeavour. Um, so we are in our development phase now. So we are about one third of the way through our development phase, scheduling to to run up to the end of of twenty twenty seven. It's very much been been designed within the legislative framework within Wales, so the Wales Environment Act, the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act, and taking a place-based approach as well. So that's why it's a distinctly Welsh initiative, it isn't just a carbon copy of the others in other parts of the UK. We very much themed this around the opportunities and challenges that face the environment within Wales. Many of them are obviously shared, but there are distinctive issues that we, we are tackling here in Wales. So that's just a, a bit of a diagram to show the, the whole of the, the different policies and legislation influencing the development. We took, um, you know, it, it was a long time developing this. Um, the application was actually submitted in February, but that was following quite a while of working uh, with across the partnership and consulting and engaging with with a wide range of of other partners within the sector. Um, and we were made aware of the outcome in the summer last year and really in terms of having staff on the ground and really getting things going that was September last year. Um, so we're aiming for February submission for stage two, how the lottery works. They give you some money uh, to undertake a, essentially a research and development phase. And then they expect a, a very detailed, thoroughly well-planned um, and you know, sort of identifying all the potential risks and also bringing additional match funding for your phase two bid. So, so that will be what we plan to submit in February 2023. And then it's a four year delivery phase. So essentially all the capital works, all of the practical in the field interventions, conservation management, people engagement, all the community focus, volunteer initiatives, all of that actually doesn't happen until we pass our phase two application and it is competitive. So we might not be successful. So it's a, it's a bit nerve wracking. So we've got lots to do. We've got lots of questions to answer and to really provide a, a strong bid to the lottery. Um, I mentioned people engagement because for National Lottery Heritage Fund as the majority funder, outcomes for people are actually the priority outcomes. So um, whilst this is a species recovery initiative seeking to try and halt the extinction of the rarest species within Wales. In terms of the National Lottery's focus, the outcomes for people are actually 
the, the, the most important for them. We really need to go through those. The outcomes for heritage in terms of the species are obviously critical. And that fundamentally is what drove the creation of the, the partnership. But actually the outcomes for people uh, require just as much work for us to assess all of the communities, consult, 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 consult with target communities and audiences, particularly less seen audiences within Wales um, who we want to reach out to, to connect with the environment sector. So a bit more on that later. So these are our kind of big, big ticket objectives and um, our long term vision and um, so it's making sure all our wildlife thrives in recovering habitats. So the species focus element is fundamental for us and um, people from all walks of life in Wales feel like they belong and benefit from a care for nature. So that inclusive uh, approach to engagement and then third one there ensuring that essentially we work across a, a fabric of, of organisations and networks within Wales. So it's not just those organisations in the core 10, it has to be across across all Wales and those who want to be involved in conservation. And the fourth one there is about having a more resilient sector, essentially. And um, so how can we train? How can we add value? How can we, in fact, bring new people into the sector who can then take forward so that there's a legacy uh, going forward? So I'm going to skip through this a little bit and then go into our kind of cross-cutting principles. I think the key thing that we learned from Back from the Brink is really about delivering multiple benefits for species. So the cross tax of working approach is really fundamental. So that if you're picking an area, you're not just necessarily only focusing on one species, you can actually take forward a, a whole clan of species within, within that particular area. Place-based approach, I've already mentioned that, that's fundamental. I'll come onto the projects more a wee bit later. And um, linking wellbeing to wildlife, we know connections that we, as this, this conference, we know connection to nature is fundamental to our wellbeing. And actually it was amazing uh, during lockdown, how many other people realized that that was also the case. And um, we already knew that. And um, what we want to do is, is try and actually spread Spread that awareness and design engagements within the program, the four-year program that ensures we can increase that connection to nature within people uh, and their communities. We need to be inclusive and we want to be inclusive. We want to be a more diverse sector with different types of people working, volunteering, taking part. And we recognise that, that that's actually a, a, a challenge for the sector. And we want to address that by working with, with minorities, black and ethnic minorities, other less seen audiences within Wales. But we must celebrate the Welsh language and Welsh culture within our programme. And you, you can see the breadth of, of areas where we're going to be focusing on. Um, and so, so in terms of Camrag is absolutely fundamental to how we deliver our people engagement. And it is very much demonstrating the sustainable management of natural resources. Uh, so this programme has that at its core, and that is the core principle of Natural Resources Wales. So as a statutory lead within, within this is, is really key that comes through within the programme delivery. And how, what will be the legacy? How can we maximise uh, the benefits across across other pro projects and programmes um, as the result of this quite significant investment within nature conservation? So I said it's quite a big investment. It's about five million pounds from the lottery, but we've also requested match funding from Welsh Government and a significant match fund from NRW has also been committed. So over the, over the span of the programme, it's 1.7 million from NRW focused on species recovery and engagement, which is great. And then in terms of Welsh Government's request, we've already had a £30,000 investment this development phase. Um, we've also asked for 800000 for the four-year delivery phase. And there are other match funders we have approached and are approaching as well. So, so trust funds, other donors to, to add value to this and, and bring up the total budget to, it's almost it's almost £9 million pounds over, over the six years. So it's a, it's a big investment within the sector. So I've already mentioned about our, we want to be focusing on skills and training, volunteer opportunities and um, people like yourselves, how, how we can involve uh, local experts. So people who are great at going out and monitoring, surveying, fundamental to understanding the current baseline now and how the species may recover going forward. So lots of opportunities there that we need to plan out well um, and consult during this development phase. Um, and then I've already mentioned the engagement is fundamental and we're already working with arts partners so arts council wales uh, and other delivery partners and how we can have really inspiring and engaging activities and events that connect people with nature uh, nature on the doorstep also understanding the weird and the wonderful and the less understood as well so some of our target species um 
are, are not very well understood. Um, some of them might be obscure lichens or, or rare plants that no one's heard of, but that doesn't mean to say they aren't wonderful. And in fact, flagging the importance of those rare species in Wales is, is a big objective for the programme. So we talked about people engagement and monies and volunteering, but what about the species? You know, what, what what did we decide that we wanted to try and take forward? It was a massive challenge when we were developing the application to try and cut a cloth and decide, well, which species should, should we should we really try and, and, and spend the money on essentially to, to try and recover within Wales? And um, going back to this first cross-cutting principle, which was trying to work across taxa um, within a particular area, um, that was really key in how we then designed the ultimate projects of which there are 11. So there's 11 projects within this program of work. I'm going to talk about them more in a minute. But first, in terms of how we try to agree upon the species. So we, 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 we actually undertook a kind of scoring system in order to say, right, OK, these should be the, the priority species that we take forward that ultimately became our list of target species. So we tried to apply scores. So this was based upon data that was available as well as professional opinions, particularly in those species where they were particularly data deficient. It wasn't always straightforward to apply these kind of scores, but we had to do a kind of like a first cut to understand, right, what, what kind of comes to the surface as, as kind of those key to take forward. And um, so looking at extinction risk in Wales. So if we could actually assign a score as to the likelihood of potential extinction um, within like a 40 year period. Um, and then we also had to look, well, okay, this is a Welsh programme uh, with Welsh public money going into it. So we need to think about the responsibility that Wales has for, for, for these species. So applying a score there where actually Wales may have a particularly, you know, high percentage of the overall population in GB, so that was that was an important sort of scoring process as well. But ultimately, we we only have four years to undertake the delivery to do the conservation action. So we had to think, well, in that four years, realistically, which species can we actually sort of move forward on recovery? Now, that picture there is the an example of a species recovery curve technique and um, so we have kind of key points along 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 a, a progression and so what we tried to do uh, with those species that kind of made it through the extinction risk scoring and then the world's responsibility scoring was then apply well how many steps along a species recovery curve could we expect to move said species during the four years that was a really tough bit to score and it, it, it was sort of very much based on on judgment and um, so we may not have got that right and in fact what we're doing now in the development phase is revisiting all of that to make sure that we're clear about what good looks like so how can we measure success and i've got some dedicated slides on that because uh, you as an audience i hope are probably more interested in that than some other people because it's quite technical but it's it's really important to how we how we do measure success but ultimately what happened is we ended up with this kind of 62 species target species that we thought right those are the ones we want to really take forward and that led to them project development. So it's all very well having a list of species, but they have to be applicable in a in a in a, in a realistic pro project approach. So we took elements of of key themes or key conservation challenges that were shared by particular groups of species, but not just plants, not just invertebrates, but looking at an area where actually there's these common issues, maybe conservation grazing, it might be nitrogen dep deposition. There could be a range of other issues within that area that we're trying to focus on or address. This is just an example of one of the projects, which is in Gwynedd. This is the Rare Arctic Alpines project. So it's an example of, of, of some of the target species that came out of that. So you can look at some of the scores there in terms of how we ended up having that uh, that list. And then ultimately some of the drivers of decline as well. That, we, that, that Some are very difficult, um, but you know there's still work that we can do to to, to add, add value and, and raise awareness. This is where the projects are. And um, so this is where the main focus of conservation activity will be. But it doesn't mean this is where all the people engage in events as well and working with national partners like the National Museum for Wales. Um, so yeah, just because uh, people don't fall within this boundary doesn't mean there won't be an tier and birth activity happening linked to, linked to engagement. But if we start in the Northwest, it's quite busy up there. So we've got RSPB are leading on the Pentlin and Anasmon project. So you can see the orange boundary there. So it's a range of different species across many habitats and um, quite themed around sort of coastal heath um, 
wetlands, um, bogs, there's, there's fenland, um, but a, a whole a whole suite of different species. Um, so quite quite sort of focused sites. Um, so working with a range of partners in, in that area. So you've got lowland nest in Curlew that are in the Kevney Valley. You've got the Cliff Mason Bee hanging on literally on the edge in terms of the UK population on the end of the Thleen um, Chuff. Um, you can also see offshore, there's a marine project. So Marine Conservation Society are the leads for our Welsh Marine Treasures project, which is focusing around Pentlean, around on the Swan, as well as around Pembrokeshire. Um, so just when I go through these projects, there's a there's a definitive lead NGO or indeed NRW with one of them, and then that doesn't mean to say that the other partners within the core to ten aren't contributing. So, it, so bug life, plant life, and others will be contributing on the RSVB led project. The RSVB are the the lead in terms of employment and in terms of procurement, but then a number of other partners are supporting as well as local delivery partners, so National Trust, Mentirmon, others. An example, uh, you know, that that's for for the Anglesey and Pentlean project. Then you've got our Arctic alpines. I've already mentioned that's the red one. So think about high and craggy. So this is the the really high areas within within the national park there, um, and it's plant life who are leading on that one with uh, a lot of input from Bug Life, NRW, National Trust, the National Park as well, so uh, a number of partners. Then in the northeast, we've got the Scarcy Yellow Sally, which Bug Life are leading on. So this is uh, an amazing stonefly, very big, at the complete edge of its range in Europe. So the next stop for a population is, is Germany and Sweden. So and then we've got this, this isolated population near Bangor on Dee on the River Dee. Um, so Bug Life are working uh, with NSW, other partners looking at, obviously, there's water quality issues there. And also Chester Zoo are, are keen to work with us on, on some of the, the sort of behaviour aspects that we don't fully understand about the, the species as well so that's really interesting um down in Powys, we've got the welsh marches project so that's very much focused on on lichens and bryophytes um so we, we we so it's actually nw who are leading on that one working with plant life and with bug life and rspb Cymru. um so quite interesting looking at you know trying to mitigate the impacts of of airborne pollution from, from agriculture. So there's kind of interesting regulatory issue there, but also um, some of the really site specific conservation work that needs to happen for dry grasslands um, and for some of those lichens as well. So re really interesting project there. And then along the south, we've got um, bumblebee conservation are leading on the Shrokarda bee. So you can see now we're falling into 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 Gwen and Glamorgan here. Um, so the, you can see the three populations there in yellow are, are basically the, you know, the total layer where shokarda occurs within Wales. So this is a single species project. So it's, but they're also looking at a potential beneficiary species that can kind of that can recover on the back of the conservation work for shokarda. So we're looking trying trying to essentially um, deliver the the species recovery strategy for shokarda be through this project. Uh, so bumblebee conservation have got staff uh, to lead on that. So Gwent levels, unsurprisingly, very important. Uh, also looking at areas in Kenfig and Bridgend, and then in South Pembrokeshire as well. Um, we've got the high brown fertility uh, project, so butterfly conservation are leading on that within the Vale of Glamorgan. Some of you will no doubt know, know that wonderful site. Um, so building on the excellent work that's been happening on sort of the volunteer network there and, and really trying to sort of, you know, invest more into the conservation management and the engagement with communities and raising the profile for that that critically important population there that's hanging on in uh, in the Vale of Glamorgan. Um, we've also then got quite a lot happening around the sort of Swansea area. So the pink boundary, which is actually from South Camargue to right the way over to Neath Patalbert, that's the, the Swansea Bay Coast Commons and Canals project. So it's bug life as well as ARC who are leading on, so that's amphibian and reptile conservation, who are leading on that program. And they're really, say, sort of focused on sort of coastal habitats and then some wetland habitats as well. Got some some very rare species near like Fenras spider, burnt tip orchid, also looking at potential works for sand lizards. Um, but also in Swansea is the Swansea uh, Leicester Horseshoe Bat project and that's being led by Back Conservation Trust. So that's a really fantastic sort of citizen science project looking um, at the, the, the movement of lesser horseshoe bats throughout Gower, Swansea City, and um, so, um, so issues around light pollution and how we can work with local authorities. So so um, and Rebecca is here today. So Rebecca's um, working with Back Conservation Trust on that project, moving that one forward in the development phase. Then into Pembrokeshire, um, we've already mentioned the Shrokarabi, we've also already mentioned the marine uh, 
program um, which is delivering around Pembrokeshire as well so you've got the pink sea fan which is distinct to this area so it's not being covered in the northwest and um, so working um, uh, the Marine Conservation Society working with NRW and other partners there and also looking at marine water quality so that's one of the key interfaces between marine and terrestrial and that's something that Natir and Beth offers that the other species recovery programs haven't got because we've got marine within within our program and um, which uh, makes our program more expensive because it's quite expensive at operating in the marine environment but looking at that water quality impact so land you know sustainable land use issues around uh, inshore water quality is is really key because that's often um a contributor to 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 um, people conservation status or not within marine conservation areas um and then barbastel bat project which so you've got a distinct sort of genetically distinct population of barbastel bats in Pembrokeshire um associated with, with those ancient woodlands um so particularly North Pembrokeshire but also South Pems as well and a bit in between in the Milford Haven so Vincent Wildlife Trust are the lead partner for that um and working with a, a whole range of, of small woodland owners and other significant landowners as well so really interesting project looking at habitat connectivity and trying to understand more about that that population that's hanging on in there so of those we reckon about 44 of the, the long list are, are potentially at risk of extinction within within you know a, a near time period um, and that's why they've been highlighted as, as key but this genesis of the projects to make sure that it makes sense why we're focusing on particular areas where there's those common themes that we can tackle is really important i'm now going to whiz through a little bit more species recovery and then i'm going to stop for questions if that's okay because i think i think that's going to be important so that's uh, all the, the the projects in terms of who who the lead partners are and the other partners supporting delivery. So I've just been through that. Um, so a few images. Let's skip through those, and then let's get on to the you know, what does success look like for species recovery. So back from the brink undertook a lot of work on this. Um, obviously with a significant input of money they had to they had to try and report whether they'd achieved recovery for the species they had 22 projects um and over 100 sort of priority species um so a huge number um and one of the learnings we had from it is don't have too many species that you're trying to actually monitor um you know success against because it's a really complex and actually time intensive um procedure to undertake and they 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 didn't have the exact methodology for how they were going to measure recovery for each of the projects so it's something that they worked on throughout the delivery phase and there's been some fantastic learning from that as I say Natural England was, was the lead but all, all the partners were involved in in sort of trying to define what what that success looks like there's a couple of papers they're not published but they are available and they should be up on the Back from the Brink website and hopefully Natural England's website going forward and um, looking at the different methods that could be employed so this is something we're trying to do now we've got a small contract and um, that we'll be letting um in the development phase to look at how we should be defining the measures of success for each of our projects each of the 11 projects and indeed those species those target species within them um, so just going back to the, that that second report there it was footprint ecology recommission that was released just before christmas so we've been sort of digesting that to to amend our own our own contract spec but they looked at sort of three three key methods uh, one was green status so this is sort of if you think about the IUCN categorization um this was deemed as you know a robust evidence based measure and um, so what they're suggesting is that um can you determine whether that species meets the regional IUCN criteria for least concern or at least or near threatened but not actually declining so you know the green within within that 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 diagram there and um, it needs a lot of data and it is less intuitive than other measures and for for short-term species recovery obtaining some of that data was was quite a challenge so so it was looked at but deemed you know it is quite a challenge it was suitable for some some of the projects um then also they were looking at favorable conservation status so this is obviously an existing tool that is used um, and for features of international sites like sac uh, spas um, another quite demanding method it requires a lot of knowledge and data i think the second point is important there in terms of using um yeah i think def defining so so i think expert opinion that's that's the thing from speaking to natural England colleagues was really key in this one in terms of applying it to bat from the brink 
not just relying upon the data, but where you can incorporate that that expert knowledge of those people that have been involved and understand the species. Now, that's that, you know, it means you're not just relying upon data, but you can pro provide a better narrative on recovery. And one of the issues from Back from the Brink was that just relying on metrics wasn't always enough in such a short time frame in terms of you know whether the abundance um could be used as a proxy for for yeah recovery whereas they know that a lot of interventions had taken place on habitat management so all of that other activity that taking place that may not re be reflected in the population numbers by the end of a four-year period but you can count as as contributing towards recovery so that narrative was was really key if you were going to use um, favorable conservation status you needed that sort of supporting evidence but it could be modified to, uh, for a kind of local population level um so you know we, we use favorable conservation status at a kind of national level but thinking about it at the population level and that was key so agreeing you know what you're recovering within what parameters um that relate to your project that that was deemed really fundamental um and then the species recovery curves approach i say curves because there's, there's different methods different curves that you can employ back from the brink actually designed their own there's one that natural england have used and um, for statutory purposes and actually rspb have been a real advocate for 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 using the species recovery curve approach and um, they're sort of broadly similar with, with some differences across the three and those were assessed by footprint ecology as part, part of this report um so it is a good you know it's, it's a really useful framework it, it kind of measures linear progress so you've got kind of starting from zero where you know nothing um so then you've got sort of monitoring that can improve your diagnosis of what declines are solution testing then solution deployment in terms of you're actually doing work and then if you get towards the end of the curve you've actually got kind of sustainable management sort of sort of status for for that species um again agreeing um you know are you, are you defining this within the context of a particular population size is is really key um i think the back from the brink found species recovery curve really useful um but again it, it doesn't have to be the, the only method that that's employed um it can be used as, as a planning tool as well so what we need to do now in back from the brink and um, sorry in the and beth is sort of try and set our, our parameters for what measuring success looks like um and so we've got this contract that was one of the learnings we had is try and set those try and set the monitoring evaluation framework now and um, before we then go into stage two so we need to reevaluate some of our original target species were they the right ones and that will take consultation in consultation with local partners and um, even with with landowners as well it might be that some sites are not viable for the management we propose so we might need to take those out and add other sites in that might impact on which target species we ultimately take forward and getting a firmer baseline for each of those agreeing the scale of recovery and actually completing the measuring impact framework so that um we've got that clear going forward so um I'm just going to touch very quickly in terms of the resources. John, we've got 10 people working on this now. John, and then uh, we'll have about we could, 21. Yeah. If we could wrap up in a minute or two, then we'll get a quick question yeah. in as well, hopefully. Thank you. Yeah, go for it. No worries. Lots of delivery partners involved as well. So it's not just those core, core partners of 10. So we've got a number of, of partners and landowners that we need to be working with. Um, and that was me. So let's go to questions. Adam. very quick wrap up well done thank you um i think our q a function is working we were just trying to test it behind the scenes um and i'm not 100 percent sure ah great we have got some so uh we'll try to take one or two anyway so um a question from matthew hopes um it says a great presentation john really interesting just wondering how people can get involved in the delivery phase when it happens such as volunteering in surveys or habitat works etc yeah well we're super keen um because there's going to be a lot a lot of field work required um and we like well nature conservation sector cannot survive without without experts volunteering their time all over the place um the, we've got particular sort of data gaps um so we need to undertake a bit of a gap analysis to see where we we, we may need uh, an increase sort of a uh, you know workforce out there uh, helping helping with the monitoring so i think if you live in a particular area uh, or you have a particular species interest so you you're willing to travel and um, then it's worth getting in touch with the the lead organization for each of those projects or you can just get in touch with us. We've got a generic inbox, so it's natirambith 
at covoithmaterialcompany.gov.uk. So if you if you just email that inbox and then we can we can what we're doing is we're, we're gradually building up a, a kind of contact database um so we can keep in touch with people with newsletters and things like that but if it's specific about monitoring and supporting that, that then we can um we can then have you on on file and but also put you in contact with the right partner but you may know who the right partner is you want to deal with in which case you can you can please feel free to get in touch with them direct we're not kind of controlling everything from the center because it's, it's such a big program and you know th those partners are the ones leading on the particular project so please feel free to get in touch with them direct and just say it's a bit nice here on Beth. fabulous john do you think you could put um if you get a chance put a couple of those email addresses in the uh in the chat function i certainly can, can. yeah still on the slot now just one more quick question so we're sort of at the end of our slot now um from yestin he said um Again, fantastic presentation. Just one question for me. Following the completion of this project, will monitoring of the endangered species continue? I guess that's a long way off in the future, but crystal ball gaze. Mm. Well, well, it, it may be a long way off, but we can't submit our phase two application without telling the lottery quite explicitly what our plans are for monitoring um, going forward. So you've got basically legacy management that will be taking place. And indeed, it's often a 10 year commitment to maintain um, features or, or management that's paid for by the lottery and, and also legacy legacy monitoring. Um, so in some instances, um, it might be that the lead partner will maintain that monitoring, working with the network of volunteers, potentially. It might be in some instances, if they're features, they could be monitored by an AW, but for on a project by project basis, the, the long term monitoring uh, sort of program needs, needs to be defined and then we'll work on that in more detail during the delivery phase. That's fantastic, John. Thank you very much. And thanks for, for attending this morning, giving up your time on a Saturday to speak to us as a really oh, no, it's great. It's a pleasure. project. Really looking forward to the uh, it, it sort of kicking off properly and the impact that it has on, on our biodiversity and getting people involved in the conservation of those, those rare species, those priority areas.